Okay. Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's lesson. I hope that you guys are all doing well. Um, for our lesson today, we shall talk about interactions in nature. That is ecology. Now, it's the topic shall be discussed in the series. Uh, for today, we shall look at uh, the concept of ecology, look at um, a few basic ecological terms. Then from there, we shall look at ecological factors, which are biotic and abiotic components of the ecosystem. Um, basically, that's what we shall be doing. Then I expect that after learning this today, you should be able to define what ecology is. You should be able to uh, define some of the ecological terms that we shall be looking at. Then you should also be able to classify ecosystems and identify their components. Then as time goes on, maybe next week we shall do food chain, food web, pyramid of numbers and so on and so forth. Then you should be able to explain those terms and uh, identify the individual components of food chain, food web. All right. Let's zoom in quickly and then look at what we have. Now in every ecosystem or wherever life exists, there is interaction between or amongst the various forms of lives. You would see plants, you would see animals, even plants, you will see different types of plants. You would see different types of animals ranging from the tiny worms through the uh, medium-sized um, ants or other insects to huge mammals such as the elephants. All these are animals that make up the ecosystem. And there are interactions. There is one depending on the other for some specific reason or something that makes it able to live you know, so in ecology biologists study the various interactions that exist among living organisms living in a specified area all right so basically ecology is the study of the interactions that exist amongst living organisms found in a particular area all right now, if you know that, then you can think about ecology in this way, that the, um, <clears throat> the human beings and mosquitoes are also living organisms living in an area, all right? The mosquito would have to feed off the blood of, li uh, of, 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 of human beings to enable it to reproduce, all right? Then, of course, the, in the process of feeding on human blood, leave malarial parasites that are pathogenic to humans. All right, so you see the effect of that interaction. Interaction between mosquitoes and humans will enable the mosquito to reproduce. At the same time, cause disease conditions in humans. Take note of that. So the study of that interaction, all right, or the scientific basis for those studies is called ecology. If you are okay with that, then okay, let me give you another, another example. Um, you see the goat, or let me say the giraffe, eating grass or browsing from tall trees because of its height. Now, what you see is that the feeding habit of the giraffe sustains its, its life, all right? And while at the same time, the, uh, um, the, um, the feeding habit of the giraffe causes damage to the plant from which it feeds, 
Do you get it? Because it's feeding off the leaves. And you know how important the leaves are to the plant. They are the, the leaves are the center for photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the only way by which plants can make their food. Now, if the leaves, which are like the, the, the center or the kitchen for preparation of food is eaten away, then somebody cannot make its own food. Then you see, you see, the, you see that interaction. All right. So basically, that is that about ecology. Let us look at some of the terms associated with the study of ecology. The first one I'd like us to look at is habitat. Now, the habitat is the place where, is a particular place in the um, ecosystem where we can locate or find an organism, all right? Essentially, it is the natural home of the organism. This is where the organism lives and can be found, all right? Now, everybody can live and be found at a particular place because of the unique adaptations, the adaptations the, um, um, the adaptations that enable it to live at that particular place. Because if you are supposed to live, for instance, in water, and you don't have the means of swimming, you cannot be there. Do you get it? If you don't have the means of breathing underwater, you cannot live there. If you don't have the means of finding food while in water, you cannot be there. You understand? Now, even if you have to reproduce in water, you should have means that will enable you to find your mate, all right, and then go through the entire process that will lead to successful reproduction, all right? So for you to be successful in your habitat, you need some unique adaptations. All right, in a broad sense, there are two main types of uh, habitats even though in elective biology i mentioned to you some other ones but basically we have aquatic and terrestrial habitats now the aquatic habitats are all the habitats that are that are water related either directly in the water or around a water source or a water body all right so we can find such habitats in the seas in the oceans, in the lakes, in the rivers, in the lagoons, in the ponds, in the ditches, in the streams, in the irrigated farmlands, all right? And every small land space around all these water bodies. So these form or constitute the aquatic habitats, all right? So all the habitats that are water related, form the aquatic habitat whereas the terrestrial habitats include farmlands bear in mind not irrigated farmlands ordinary farmlands we have parks i don't know if you you know about the kakum national park you know the um, um the mole national park if you have heard about the fijai national park if you have heard about the Chai Hills Resource Reserve, all these are parks, okay? Um, we have rainforests, we have deserts, we have the savannas, and so on and so forth. These are terrestrial habitats. These are the habitats that are on land, that are on land, okay? The habitats that are away from water. Then there's a third one, which is the... Um, which is the arboreal habitat. Arboreal gives the idea of um, habitats that are in the air or in trees, all right? So you see nests of birds in trees. You see uh, some animals that are restricted to living in trees. Example is the koala, the, um, um, the uh, bush baby, and so on and so forth. These, these animals are limited to living in trees and they, have, they, are, they live in what we call the arboreal habitats. All right, the next one I would like to talk about is the species.
yeah, I'm sorry for that. The next one I would like to talk about is the species. And the species, um, you know, in the classification we learned some time back, the species is the smallest rank or the smallest taxon in the um, 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 in the general classification of organisms. And if you recall, um, we said that species are those individuals that are so closely related that they will interbreed to produce new fertile offspring under normal conditions, under normal circumstances, all right? So you see that in the picture I have here, these are, these are, this is a picture of insects. Picture of uh, uh, beetles for that matter, beetles for that matter. They resemble each other. There is so much, there, there's striking resemblance in this picture that I have here. However, they are not of the same species because if you cross any two of them, you will not get a fertile offspring that can also reproduce another offspring, all right? So you see that the goats and the sheep, for instance, no matter how strikingly uh, they resemble each other, they will not be able to reproduce an offspring that will also reproduce another offspring. So we say that they are not of the same species, all right? Number, each species is isolated from another by the sole ability to interbreed, all right? So if you put a group of sheep, or if you take one sheep from Ghana and another different sheep from China and you cross them, you will still have an offspring called sheep, all right? That will also be able to give birth to another sheep. That is what we call interbreeding, all right? Now, look at us. Humans, we are also very different, quite. We, 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 are, we are different. For instance, I am dark, all right? But there are some other people who are fair. Some people are tall. Some people are short and all that. But then we are all humans, okay? Now, even um, Chinese people are markedly different from a lot of other people, all right? But if you cross or if a Chinese man marries a Ghanaian woman, they will still reproduce human beings who will also be capable of reproducing human beings. That means that human beings, wherever they are on the surface of the earth, are of the same species, all right? But if you take, if you take, if you take, um, um, if you take a lion and a tiger, no matter how, no matter how closely uh, uh, um, um, they resemble, they will not be able to reproduce fertile offspring. I think that should be okay for you uh, uh, with this because we have looked at it um, some time back. All right. If you're okay, then let's look at the population. Now, population refers to um, the total number of members of a species that occupy a particular place at a time, all right? So members of uh, a particular species that are present at a place at a time. Members of the same species occupying a spe specific geographic area at a time, all right? So for instance, uh, um, if you come to campus, we shall look at a population of grasses in the lawn in front of the science block, all right? All the grasses over there, the grasses over there are of the same species. So we look at them. That if we count the numbers, that becomes the population of the grass species over them. Now, if we go to the um, um, if we go to the, the the pond, we can look at the number of frogs that are there. That gives us the population of frogs. Okay, then uh, even in the school, we can look at the number of students or the number of humans in a school or the number of humans in a stadium. So that number gives us the population of humans, okay? Now, every country has citizens that are numbered. We have the population census, all right? Now, in the population census, we are only looking at the specific numbers 
of the individual members of the country. All right, so to speak. Okay, now from population, let's come to community. Now the community refers to several populations of different species that are found in a habitat. Population, ref uh, sorry, community refers to several populations of different species in a habitat. So if you want to take, a, a, you want to take sunrise as an example, we shall be looking at a, 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 sun, the Sunrise Campus as a community. Then we want to look at the different populations of human beings. That's one population. Population of uh, beetles. No, we, let's look at population of rhinoceros beetles over there. Then we look at population of uh, andropogon grasses. Then we shall look at population of tall trees. We shall look at population of uh, um, um, any specific, any species, all right? Any species or any specific organism. Population of red ants, population of tiger ants, population of termites. So we want to look at the individual numbers of these various species, all right? So in the community, you will see different species with their different populations. How that makes sense to you. All right, then let's look at what the ecosystem is. Now, the ecosystem comprises different populations. Now, you know that different populations refers to a community, all right? So different communities, and their environment. That's the ecosystem. All right. So if you take sunrise again, for example, we are looking at all the surroundings of sunrise campus. What else do we see apart from the living organisms that are in the that are in, uh, on the campus? That gives you an idea of what the ecosystem is. So the ecosystem has to do with the living organisms the non-living organisms and the interactions that exist between living organisms and living organisms and then living organisms and the non-living part of the ecosystem. I hope, I hope, I hope you are getting it. The ecosystem uh, is made up of living parts and non-living parts, all right? Now for it to be a system, there must be defined interactions between the living and the living and then the living and the non-living that is how it becomes a system all right okay let's look at the biosphere now the biosphere is the part of the atmosphere that allows for life all right, so the part of the surface of the earth where living things exist. The part of the earth where you can find living things. The part of the earth where you can find living things. So the part of the light, uh, of atmosphere that supports life. Which part of the atmosphere uh, supports life? We can mention land. Then we have what we call the terrestrial habitat. We can mention water, which makes up the aquatic habitat. Then, of course, we can mention some parts of air, which makes uh, up the arboreal um, 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 ecosystem or habitat. All right, let's continue. And look at ecological factors. Now, <clears throat> The ecological factors of, um, of every living thing refers to all the factors, both living and non-living, all right? That's, um, that's the organism will interact with, all right? So you know that, you, I don't know if you ever heard about this saying that no one is an island on earth. You know, there is always an interaction 
between somebody and another person or with the environment okay so in 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 this lesson we refer to all the the factors that living organisms uh, interact with as ecological factors we refer to all these factors as ecological factors and they are both living and non-living factors the living factors are called biotic factors for us the non-living factors are called abiotic factors take note of the pronunciation abiotic all right <clears throat> now let me give you an example again if you come to our human society there are different professions there is for example the teacher uh, of which i am a proud <laughs> I'm also a proud teacher, you know. There is the nurse, there is the medical doctor, there is the um the um there is the market woman, there is the the farmer, of course there is the student. Okay, so let's take the student uh, um um as 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 a unit in the society. Now the student would have to eat, is that correct? And the student goes to uh, depend on the food produced by the farmer all right the student would have to go to school and be taught then you see the the teacher or the lecturer over there the student when they fall sick would have to go to the hospital and they will meet the nurses and the doctors over there all right so you see the you see the interdependence now of course if the student is going to the farmer for food the student is going to pay for it all right so whilst the the farmer supplies food, the student also enriches the farmer with money, all right? And this money could be used to buy some other thing or make another investment by the farmer. I hope you get it. So that is, that is how, that, that's just an idea of the, the, the more complex interactions that happen in nature. Everybody, and for that matter, every living organism depends on either another living organism or some other non-living organisms or both. We are not islands. We all interdepend. All right. Now, even right now, the interface we are using now is, is so much in the uh, 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 dependence. All right. You still need an information and the information I have, I also have to send it to you. So we are also interacting and we can say that the whole system over here is probably an ecosystem. All right, so let's look, let's start with the abiotic factors. These are uh, non-living parts of the environment that affect living things and their environment. Non-living parts or physical factors that affect living things and their environment, all right? So some of them are rainfall, uh, slope of land, altitude, acidity, or uh, hydrogen ion concentration, wind, and so on and so forth. Basically, all abiotic factors, no matter how difficult, can be measured. We can put values to them. And in the subsequent lessons, I shall be showing you in detail how each of these ones affects, how each of these factors affect life on or in an ecosystem and uh, a, 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 brief, a brief information on how to get to measure them, some of the measuring units, measuring instruments, and so on and so forth. The first abiotic factor that I would like us to look at is temperature. It is first because to me, it is strikingly important. And, and without temperature, um, I'm not sure that any of us would be able to, you know, because a bunch of the warmth that we, we, we need comes from the sun and that forms temperature. Without that warmth, all that energy that the plants are able to tap to make food, none of us would be able to survive or would be able to, you know, to live. 
All right, so the first one is temperature. And look, it is a very important factor which, which, has, which has very important effects on, on, on every living organism, all right? I mentioned it to you again that it is by temperature that plants are able to make their food, all right? You know, the temperature is supplied by the heat energy coming from, or the, the solar energy coming from the sun, all right? Then, then once the food is produced, other organisms which are consumers go and eat it, all right? After that, they also die or they ingest the undigested parts, all right? Then it takes some microorganisms to break down these uh, dead parts or undigested parts of the food, you know, to turn it back into nutrients for the soil, all right? And that happens more rapidly under or at high temperatures, all right? If the temperatures are, are, are low, you see that the, the, the rate of decomposition will be very low. Now, if you can, if you are very observant, you realize that especially in the rainy season, there is so much filth around everywhere. The environment smells more, more, much more compared to during the dry seasons. You know why? Because during rainy seasons, temperatures are low and therefore there is reduced um, rates of decay of organic matter. Now you could see during the rain season, you would see dead, dead parts of animals and plants all over on the ground, on the surface of the earth. All right. And, and, and then it comes with so much stench. There's so much smell coming or uh, emanating from, from those areas. If you go to the um, rubbish dumps, you will see that there's so much of undecayed uh, uh, um, organic matter over them. It is because temperatures are low and microbial activities that result in decay or decomposition, all right, become very low. All right, high temperature also has physical effects and um, uh, such as increasing the rate of evaporation of water, causing the soil to dry out and more and uh, making it difficult to till the soil during dry season. Now, if there is no, if, if temperatures are high, of course, there is an increased rate of evaporation. Even on life, every living organisms, even on living organisms, especially, for example, mammals, during high temperatures, we sweat. We sweat. And you know that sweating is evaporation of water from the body of a mammal. Of course, the same thing happens in plants, but this is called transpiration. As for this, it's not ordinary water that, uh, that comes out, but it is uh, water in the form of vapor, all right? And they, they, they lose the water through their leaves. Remember, that is called transpiration, all right? Now, increased temperature also causes the soil to become dry, dry. So there's, in fact, the water evaporates from the, um, um, from, from, from the soil surface, all right? And the evaporation of water from the soil and the, the, the plant parts together is called evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration. All right. Now, during the dry season, you would all agree with me that the soil becomes harder and more difficult to till, more difficult to manipulate. All right. So that is that. Then it also causes rivers and streams to dry up during the dry season, leading to problems of drought. Okay. These are things that you all agree with me without doubt that sometimes too, during the dry season, irrigation becomes a problem because the soil absorbs so much water and so the streams are even getting dry water becomes just scarce you don't get water for any any uh, active agricultural um, um, work okay some uh, on the other hand low temperatures slow down growth of uh, uh, growth and some other activities of, of, of living organisms. 
All right. Now, low temperatures will, uh, for instance, cause fruits to ripen slowly, or it reduces the it reduces the rate of ripening of fruits. Low temperatures would also decrease the rate of metabolism or the metabolic processes in living organisms. For instance, if, you're, if, 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 if you are extremely cold, it is difficult. I mean, it, um, your rate of, for instance, um, digestion also lowers. Mm? The, um, 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 the process of, of regulating amount of water in your body becomes high. That is why during very low temperatures or when it is raining, during the rainy season, you urinate more often and in fact in large quantities. I don't know if you have ever experienced that, that during the, during, when, when it is raining, during the rainy season, you don't, you, you don't, in fact, you urinate often and in very large quantities. All right. It is because the temperatures are low. Temperatures are low, and so the body is not using up the waters, the waters that are in the body to, you know, to control any temperature. So there's so much water left for you, uh, for the body, and it must be getting, it must be gotten rid of. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> temperatures. The instruments used to measure temperature is called thermometer. As for this one. There's no doubt about that. The second very important um, abiotic factor is rainfall. Now rainfall is, is part of precipitation. And precipitation is every form of water that falls to the ground. So we have rainfall, we have snow, we have fog, um, we have hail. Yeah, I remember four. And in this, our lesson, I would like us to focus on rain. We all know the impact of rain. And I just last week, there was so much rainfall. I think about four hours of downpour and Accra is bending on their knees again and some other parts of the country. You know, too much or high amount of rainfall leads to flooding. And once there is flooding, most organisms' habitats become displaced, all right? The water occupies or the water takes up the space which they live in. And so you see living organisms, including human beings, you know, uh, um, um, struggling to survive, where to live, you know. Then if there is no rainfall too, then it means that um, 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 there's going to be a lack of water, like I said, you know, every living organism needs water for their life processes. If the water is not available, some of them have um, uh, 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 have adaptations that enable them to become almost dead. We call that the enter topple. Some of them in the temperate regions will undergo what we call estivation, and then in the dry season, uh, in the uh, our part of the world, which is the um, we who are around the equator, uh, it is um, a estivation. Okay, I forgot when I remember, I'll let you know. Ah. All right, so of course, rainfall, um, appropriate amount of rainfall will enable or enhance plants growth, all right? Um, <clears throat> It will also um, provide the optimum. Uh, okay, uh, appropriate amount of rainfall is good for every living organism, especially even during birth of newborns and so on and so forth. So there mustn't be. So some, uh, in fact, some organisms have synchronized their reproduction times, okay, to times where there is no, there is not too much rainfall, there is not too much temperature. And everything is, is, is almost stable. All right. 
the amount of rainfall determines the type of uh, vegetation that will grow in a particular area. Now, if you go to the forest regions, or let me say the uh, rainforest, the tropical rainforest. Good. Let me come back. I was telling you that those animals in the temperate regions have adaptations for topo, and it is called uh, hibernation. Hibernation instead. Then those in the tropics, where we are in Africa, it is called estivation. All right. Let's continue. Now, if you look at the tropical rainforest, <coughs> tropical rainforest over there, there is almost um, rain. There is rainfall almost every time of the year. All right. Uh, places in the eastern region where we have the mount the mountains, uh, Azim area. That's that's that area forms a tropical rainforest area. All right. So, because there is rain all the time, the plants that grow there, the animals that grow there are different from the plants and animals that are at areas like shy hills where there is not, uh, where we don't have rains all throughout the year. All right. Then there are some. Of course, the plants and animals that uh, survive in the deserts are different from those plants and animals that are in the savannas. All right? Okay. Then let's look at the abiotic factor, light. Now, light is very, it's also very important because without light, the plants will not be able to manufacture their own food and it is and if there is no food made by the plants then we and all other animals will not be able to survive because trust me everything you eat or drink is coming from either a plant it's coming mainly from a plant source because the other animals animal parts of our food are also uh, those animals also get their uh, nutrients from plants. All right, so photosynthesis is the backbone of life on Earth. Because without photosynthesis, oh, we are all dead and gone. In fact, we will not even live before we die safe. <laughs> all right, that's just by the way. Now, light intensity affects green plants more than animals because it is the green plants that utilize the light for photosynthesis. I hope, I, hope, I hope that statement makes sense to you. In water, light intensity decreases with increasing depth of the water, all right? And that affects the distribution. And of course, the type and distribution of, um, of, of plant species growing at the different depths. So if you take the, the river ecosystem, for instance, you will see more plants at the edges of the of the of the um of the river all right or what we call what some people call the water mouth or the river mouth all right there is more uh, plant species over there then if you get right about a few meters maybe um 20 meters deep there are more plants and animal species in that space than when you get deeper you know why because the deeper you go, the less amount of light you get, all right? Or the deeper you go in water, the darker it becomes. But you know that plants need the light to make the food, all right? So normally they grow, the plants do well at where there is a lot of light. And that is around 20 meters up the water. So the deeper you go, the less amount of plants you will get or the less number of plant species you will get. All right. Then somebody will ask them, how does uh, photosynthesis occur down there in the deep um, um, ocean floors? We have some other microorganisms that use chemicals to produce um, um, their own food on which the animals living in the uh, uh, bottom would depend. 
Okay. Light intensity can be measured using a photometer or light meter. Mind you, rainfall can be measured using the rain gauge. Amount of rainfall can be measured using the rain gauge. Okay. Let's now look at humidity. Now, humidity is the measure or the amount of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. <coughs> <coughs> the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Now, <coughs> All right, let's continue. Look, let's look at relative humidity as um, another abiotic factor. And I told you that it is the measure of the um, amount of moisture in the atmosphere, all right? And I was making the point that um, fluctuations in this um, factor has more impact on small invertebrates and higher plants than other organisms. The reason being that the higher up you get, the more humidity there is, all right? And you would agree with me that higher plants or taller plants are more exposed to the space at higher heights, all right, than those small invertebrates, okay? <clears throat> and of course, they would also need the amount of uh, water in the atmosphere for some of their life activities. I mean, the plants, all right? So, and okay, so even with, if there is no amount of moisture in the atmosphere, then plants will be losing the water in them into the atmosphere. And I told you the loss of water by plants is called what? Transpiration, all right? So, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. So, did you hear what I said about humidity? No, sir. Okay. Let's go. Um. So. Fluctuations in relative humidity will affect the rate of transpiration in plants and animals. Sir, please repeat. Sir. You, let's continue. I'll give you. I'll give you time after the class to to make your inputs. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Let's look at the next factor, which is wind. Wind. Now, many habitats are affected by the direction and magnitude of winds, all right? Now, effective dispersal of some fruits and seeds depends on the prevailing winds, all right? <clears throat> now, um, dispersal is the distribution or scattering away of fruits and seeds from their parent plants, all right? So wind uh, um, um, plays a major role in scattering the fruits from the parent, the parent plant, all right? And of course, um, some pollen grains are born in the air or they are born
worn by the air, um, some uh, spores of, of microorganisms such as amoeba, sparagera, and so on and so forth are also born in the air, all right? So without, without wind, all these life would not be able to survive, okay? Of course, if the magnitude or the strength of the wind is too high, you, you all bear with me that <laughs> the, the habitats of these organi organisms would be destroyed. In our world or in, our, in, in real life, what we say is that the wind ravages people's buildings, you know, ravages uh, uh, um, markets, churches, and uh, places, places of, of gathering, you know, the wind, the wind has very, very, very disastrous impact. You, know, you remember the infamous June 3rd disaster, uh, twin disaster that happened in Accra, all right? So the wind is very, very important in, in, in life. Strong winds can cause soil erosion. They can damage trees and uproot smaller plants. Last week, last week it rained here in home amidst heavy storms. And you go to some farms and all the maize they had planted had all been uprooted, maize and groundnut, all uprooted. Some of them have bent, you understand? So the effect of wind is damaging, but of course it is also very good for distributing or dispersing fruits and seeds, all right? The, bear in mind that the animals that live in the air, especially the birds, also, uh, they have their movements and their velocities impacted either adversely or, or, or positively by the direction of the wind and the strength of the wind, all right? If the wind blows too much, hey, every, bed, every flying bird becomes grounded, all right? No movement. But if, it is, if the wind is blowing in the direction that the bird is moving, you would agree with me that that becomes an advantage of the bed, for the bed. Is that correct? Yeah. So that is that is that is that about wind. The wind direction is measured using what we call the um, anemometer. For us, sorry, a uh, wind vane. For us, the wind direction is oh man, wind direction is measured using wind vane, and the wind speed is measured using the anemometer, all right? I said wind direction is measured using wind vane. And then the wind speed is measured using the anemometer, anemometer. The next factor I would like us to look at is the altitude. Now, the altitude is the vertical height above sea level, all right? As altitude increases, air, pressure, and oxygen levels decrease, all right? Living organisms at high altitudes will have to adapt to cope with these conditions, all right? Now, let me mention again to you that um, places like Abetifi, Kweu, and Ebri, and uh, places getting close to Kofoidia, okay, uh, Nkoko areas in the eastern region are places with high altitude. And so there is limiting amount of air, limiting amount of pressure, and limiting amount of oxygen in these areas. All right. And so all the organisms, including human beings over there, have unique adaptations that enable them to live under such conditions, all right? And that is the reason why even you, when you get to higher altitudes, you have a reaction. Either some people begin to run, some people have what we call, what people describe as a, a turning phase or so. You know, people have a lot of reactions uh, uh, to height, all right? And then let me tell you one very practical application of this, this concept. It is, you know, people in Kenya, 
um, 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 Jordan, um, Nairobi. Hey, where does this guy come from? Jamaica, Jamaica, good. These areas are high altitude areas, okay? And what happens, what the, uh, what, how human beings are adapted to that is that because there is little amount of oxygen, there is a high amount of uh, uh, red blood cells, okay? So that the little oxygen that is available will be picked up quickly by the numerous red blood cells, okay? And so because of that, they breathe very fast. <laughs> Their breathing is almost like panting for us in the normal uh, uh, land, 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 land height. Okay, so because of that, they are able to utilize more energy efficiently than we can. That is why it takes them longer to get tired. All right, if you're running a race with somebody from Kenya, I'm sure that. <laughs> The, the Kenyan the, the Kenyan guy will, 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 will defeat you because they are because of the their altitude. They are high up there and they have adaptations that enable them to live high up there. So if you have any competition uh, uh, where the altitude is low where the altitude is low they, they are then they, they, they have an adva ad an advantage. All right. The same way, if you play or if you if you are at the seashore, you have a lot of oxygen. Okay, so you have limited amount of uh, uh, red blood cells. Okay, because of that, the little thing you do will make you get tired. Because the cells, will, the oxygen in the cells, in fact, the cells are not enough to transport the oxygen to other parts of the body. Let's continue and look at depth of water. Organisms living in water are, it should be able to cope with changes in pressure, amount of light, oxygen concentration, temperature, and, in, and those that live in uh, salty water or seawater, the saltiness of the water. All right. Now, pressure. Pressure increases with depth, whilst oxygen and temperature and light decreases with, with depth. So it means that the deeper you get in water, the higher the pressure on you, all right? The same time, the darker it becomes, and then the less amount of oxygen you have available over there. And then, of course, you become colder the deeper you get into the water. So if you are an organism living at any depth of the water, you should have specific adaptations that will enable you to live over there. All right. Okay, so basically, um, that is what I have for you guys today. You can now um, unmute and then let me have a feedback from you. Yes, raise your hand if you have any concerns. Okay, Tiola Zaglo. Let me hear you. What do you have? Yes, Tiola. Uh, please. Yes. 
Stella, we can't hear you. Say. Yes. I said I want to see the previous slides. Like I wasn't here from the beginning of the lesson. Okay, I will put this slide on the Google Classroom. Okay. So that everybody okay. can get access to it. Okay. So don't worry Thank about you. The, don't worry about the slides. I'll I'll let you have them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Okay, are you asking anything? All right, so take note of the of the following announcement. I shall put the slides together with the uh, Please go back to the beach side. Uh, Let's say something about the beach. Which one? The beach. We're talking about the beach. When beach. you go to the beach. Yes. Um, Emmanuel, I don't get that part of. I mentioned ditches. Is that what you're talking about over here? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, aquatic habitats, yes. So what's your question? The thing about the beach that the oxygen there is not enough. So we won't elaborate it more again. Ah, uh, okay, beach, beach. Those that live close to the seashore, they rather have a lot of oxygen, all right? I listen carefully. Emmanuel, at the beach or at the seashore, there is a lot of oxygen. But the adaptation over there is that they don't have a lot, the people over there don't have a lot of red blood cells to pick up the oxygen to other parts of their body. All right. So because of that, they are not as uh, resilient as those who do not have the oxygen, but have a lot of red blood cells. So over there, you know, I don't know if you ever watched the beach soccer, the people who play the beach soccer, you know, they, they are always panting throughout the entire uh, 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 game period because there is so much tiredness. It's not just because of the sun but because the body is not able to utilize or make use of the abundance of oxygen that is there at the sea, the sea, uh, on the sea. Now, again, you would recall, I don't know if you really know about this, that airports are sighted, international airports are sighted close to the sea. You know why? Close to the sea because the sea has a store of so much oxygen that the aeroplanes, when they are taking off, will have to pass there and collect oxygen. Because I told you that the higher up you get, the less amount of oxygen is available for your consumption. So the aeroplane goes there to pick up oxygen. There's a system that, that harvests the oxygen. All right, so those of you who, who live in Accra, maybe Labadi, Osu, uh, Teshi, some Accra Central, Choco area there, you realize that the aeroplanes will pass from the airport, which is around 37, or will come and pass on the sea before taking route to wherever they are going. It is so that they will collect oxygen for use when they go high up. I hope you understand that now. But yeah. those, who, those who are already high up, like people who live in Kenya, Jamaica, they don't have a lot of oxygen. But the body produces a lot of red blood cells to pick the little amount of oxygen to send to other parts of the body. All right. So for them, they don't easily get tired. All right. 
because the little they have, they can maximize its use. They can use it to the to the highest minimum, uh, the highest. Um, um, I mean, to maximum. All right. Are you okay with that? So we are okay. Okay, if you have any, if any of you has any other question, ask before I tell you what to do. Okay, before then, let's go to the humidity. I was experiencing humidity at the time that there were some hitches with my connection. I was saying that humidity is a measure of the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. All right. So sometimes it is not raining, but you realize that the air that is blowing is very cool. All right. Probably because of the amount of water or water vapor that is in the um, um, in the air. So that is humidity. And I'm saying that um, uh, fluctuations in this humidity affect the distribution of organisms, especially small invertebrates. So invertebrates are those animals that do not have a backbone, all right? So you're talking about insects, snails, um, um, yes, insects and snails for that matter would be enough, all right? Then higher plants, plants that are uh, um, taller and more advanced, okay? Now we are saying that if you go high, humidity increases. But if you come down, humidity decreases. You agree with me that ants and snails and uh, slugs all live on the ground, all right? Where you will agree with me again that humidity becomes minimal. All right, so if you have to live on the ground as an invertebrate or you have to live low, then you have to have some adaptations, either behavioral, morphological, or structural. All right, that will enable you to live where humidity is low. Okay, then again, if you are high up there especially higher plants and those animals that live in higher plants, then of course you must also develop some uh, adaptations that will enable you to survive at such a region. All right. Then again, I told you that um, the loss of water from plants is called transpiration. Now, if we have a lot of water moisture or water vapor, yes, water vapor in the atmosphere, then there will not be a lot of transpiration or loss of water from the plants, okay? Then the opposite works also, that when we have increased, or sorry, decreased humidity, then the loss of water from the plants also increases, all right? If the, weather, if the weather is cold, then we know that humidity is high. During those times, we don't sweat that much, do we? Right. It is because there is so much moisture already in the atmosphere. So there is no need for the body to lose water again. So the water becomes conserved. And I'm telling you, that is why, that is why around these times, you urinate more. In fact, more often and in higher quantities because there is, there is high humidity in the atmosphere. Okay. So any, any, any more questions? Okay, if, you, if there's no question, then mind you, you should all get to the, um, the, the WhatsApp page created for you and also get to the Google Classroom. I think my, the, the code for my uh, class will be shared over there if it has not been shared yet, all right? 
then I will put the slides, all right, over there for you to download. I will give some assignments as well, all right. Then if you are not able to ask your questions now, every concern you have about the class, in fact, integrated science biology, you put them over there in the space that will be created for me. Is that okay? All right. If you don't have any other thing for me, I am done with what I have for you. Have a good day and a wonderful weekend ahead. It's bye from here.